Let's just record it. It's a... Just reframe that. There you go. It is 9 a.m. and at nine seconds, and I want to maximize as many of the seconds as we have with each other this morning. Glad to have you back. Those of you who were here last week, uh, some of you, I think, for the first time today, uh, so glad. I'm, uh, the recording that we did of the class last week uh, has close to 500 views now, which is pretty cool. So there is interest both in our church, and then we're seeing interest beyond uh, our church as well, which is exactly what uh, I was hoping for. And uh, but most of all, I'm glad we're able to share this space together um, here. So let's open with a word of prayer, and we will jump in. Loving God, you have promised us that wherever two or more are gathered, together in your name that your spirit is present in our midst and so we pray come holy spirit come and open our hearts and our minds as we seek to better understand your will for us your people we pray in jesus name amen so hopefully everybody got one of these a little hand down nothing too serious but allows you to follow along a little bit as to what we're doing. I had asked you, if you're able to, to read the first two chapters of our book. Is anybody still looking for, yes, all right, they're on order and they are, as far as I know, not here yet, um, but they should be here soon. So sorry for the, the slow on that. The great problem is, is that people uh, want the book and are reading it. So it's a really good problem they have, but there are more on the way. So we're going to try to, to cover the first couple chapters today. If we really get moving, we'll, we'll spill over into number three, but I'm guessing we really are going to stick with uh, the first two. And so um, we ended last week, and I wasn't able, I gave you all a discussion question to consider, and I thought instead of me blabbing for a while and then getting to the last second saying, are there any reflections, maybe we could start with a couple reflections. And so the first question that I had asked you to consider last week is how is it that you personally came to hold your understanding of marriage? Who taught you that? Where did you learn your understanding of marriage from? So that's one question, and we're obviously not going to be able to hear from everybody, but if someone has done any real reflection on that question, I'd love to hear a response on that. So, yeah. I was at OSU in 1964, and there was a group called the Campus Rock Christian uh, Men and Women. It was they had a whole thing on sex and selfhood, led by Dr. Folkman, who was a Jewish rabbi, Dr. Um, Otis Maxfield from First Community, and a Baptist minister. He always called himself a fearless Baptist, named Frank. <laughs> and that was one of the things they covered. They covered same-sex marriage they or same-sex same -sex relationships. relationships. Probably and marriage would be a little too early on the agenda. Kids, yeah. 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 But we did about a six-week study on just our selfhood. Uh -huh. just, oh, yeah. And, and, and what they taught you, you said what year was this? 1964. 64, and it was an open understanding. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, the yeah, Ohio no. Union, the old Ohio Union. Wow. Ohio. And it wasn't a condemning view of same-sex no. relationships or orientation. No. And I answered, I read all these questions about all kinds of things. And... Wow. wow. That's amazing. Well, there 1964. were a lot of coming out. Yeah. There were, there were of course. Of yes. People were a little young. 
I, I, mean, I am, but I, I, you're right. I didn't live to uh, a certain study. <laughs> Yes, I believe all three of these children are dead now. Yeah, so. but in the '64, you think the year before, Kim is having his dream yeah. on the National Oval, and so in '64, you couldn't be a person of color and buy a home in these neighborhoods, okay. right? right? That wasn't possible. It wasn't um, until the late '50s, I think, that my dad was adopted to buy a home in Arlington. Yeah, yeah, because because Italians weren't white, well, not to start with. Yeah. They right, as immigrant. many other immigrant groups were not white when they first came here, right? They had to kind of aspire to whiteness, be included in it, and when they were, suddenly all, this, all, all of a sudden, the privileges come, come with. So 1964, that's amazing. Wow, thank you. Which shows, and we, when we do kind of historical research into movements of oppression, whatever they are, and, and movements of abolition, there's a, a historical uh, sympathy that we should probably have towards, you know, everybody thought that way. But there's another side of that where you say, no, not actually everybody didn't. <laughs> you know, when, when we think of uh, abolition in this country, the idea that, well, everybody thought that people of color were inferior. Um, even, even Lincoln did for a good portion of, you know, Lincoln's solution for a long time was to send all uh, black people back to Liberia. That was the solution before another one came. And so Lincoln had views on race that we go, well, that's not great. Um, and we have sympathy because of the time and place. But there were others in whatever time and place we're thinking of who were able to think outside what they were taught. And so here you are in 1964 being given some good teaching. That's amazing. The other question I'd love if, um, to hear from you is having known someone, gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, whatever, somewhere on the spectrum, has that changed your understanding? Knowing someone personally, hearing their stories, has that changed your understanding of love, relationships, marriage, and sexuality? It has. Yes. Bonnie, you want to share? Yeah. I, I can't think when I moved to Juilliard, but it was a, sometime in the Bonnie, can you speak up? Mask. Or take the mask off for a minute. I moved to Durban Village. I, I don't even know when it was. It was in, sometime in the 60s. And I had a friend who had been playing bridge with some Durban Village people. Two guys in Durban. She got married and she said, I don't think I should do this anymore, but could you take my place? So I did. And I went there and there was a lady who became my adopted grandmother, or my adopted mother, and these two gay guys. Mm -hmm. And it's the first that I ever knew them of any gay people. Mm -hmm. And we became very, very good friends. Yeah. They traveled a lot, and they, if anybody that they traveled with was going to be in Columbus, they'd always invite them for dinner. Yeah. And so I got, but those of us that lived there got invited for dessert. Mm -hmm. So I did that for quite a while. And then I got invited to this one thing. And I went there and I got my drink in the kitchen and I walked into the room where everybody was. And we started talking and I realized I was the only girl there. <laughs> and so this is not good. <laughs> so I finished my drink. I walked out to the kitchen. I said to the guy, I have to leave now. And he said, what's your problem? And I said, I don't really have a problem that I know of, except I don't like being the only woman in the room. And three people said, Bonnie, there are more queens here than you would ever <laughs> <laughs> To which I said, what's a queen? <laughs> right. Oh, that's wonderful. Do you remember about what years we're talking about here? Maybe early 70s. Yeah, yeah early yeah. 70s. Lots of liberation was taking place. Yeah. So Lots of minority groups down. finding solidarity, voice together, and as they organize themselves, as they organize into communities, all of a sudden, uh, things can begin to change. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. They did. Thank you. <laughs> Joanna? And we were 80s college, so we were the um, height of AIDS mm -hmm. yeah. and stuff, so we lived through that, but I know my freshman year, I had to introduce myself to somebody in class and all and I look at this guy and I'm like, ooh, he's nice looking, I'll introduce myself to him. <laughs> it went, oh, it wasn't him. 
<laughs> and we became very good friends. And then at one point, we were celebrating his roommate's birthday, and he was he said, "I have something to tell you, and I'm afraid I would lose your friendship." And he told me at that point he's gay, and his boyfriend was Sean, his roommate. And my first thought was, oh, "Shoot, I can't do that." Because <laughs> that's what I thought. And I was very right. naive at that point. I, now I look back and I'm like, oh yeah, all the signs were there. Mm -hmm. But we were best friends for years. Mm -hmm. So it, it died a natural death when we, when, after um, we moved, we were in different states. But yeah. that was really my first exposure. And yeah. Then we got to go to the gay bars with him. So yeah. that really opened my eyes a lot. Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. Um, there's a there's a um, a way that in this discussion in the church, um, by again, well, I mean, I'm going to try to hold my principle from last week, which is always thinking the best about those with whom I disagree. And if you catch me doing something less than that, please point it out to me. Uh, but there is a way that those who hold very firmly the traditional understanding of marriage between one man and one woman, um, as a as a uh, theological position, they'd say, look, you can't allow your experience to determine your understanding of Scripture. Instead, we got to go to the Scriptures first, not to our experiences, because experiences can lead us astray. Experiences change, you know, as, as we change and move through time, but the Scriptures remain the same, and so we need to go to the Scriptures first, ask it the questions that we want about marriage, and then bring those to our experience, not the other way around. Um, which I'll say, for me, it was a pretty compelling argument for a long time when I was in the conservative traditional camp. And again, please hear me when I use those words. These are not derogatory. It's neither bad to be traditional, nor is it bad to be conservative. <laughs> These are descriptions of myself, self-identified when I was in those spaces. Um, and I'm not better now that I'm outside of those spaces. I've simply changed. So I hope if some of those words apply to you, I am not degrading you nor your background. Um, just describing my experience uh, and using the best language we have to do that. Um, so, it's a, it, to me at the time, it's a pretty compelling argument. Look, uh, I mean, I love people who are gay too, but what does that have to do with my understanding of the Bible? Right? Um, and, and we can't allow uh, culture to just tell us what to believe in our theology, right? Because then we're going to be subject to the whims of whatever happens to be in vogue at that given time. Um, Kathy and Beth, if you want to pull down those blinds, you're certainly welcome to. <laughs> They're not hard to come down. You, you look like you're being uh, flushed out by the sun. Uh, so what I want to start with today in terms of our biblical reflections is what if the Bible actually gives us warrant to go to our experience as a way to understand what God's will is for our life? Because if we have scriptures that say, hey, pay attention to your experience, Pay attention to the stories of the people around you and how uh, living out their faith is working or not working in their life. If we had, oh, say the words of Jesus on something like that, that might be a real help to us. And of course, of course we do. And so uh, this first passage from Matthew chapter 7 that is printed on your handout here. These are the words of, of Jesus. And of course, we should know up front, does Jesus ever speak directly about same-sex anything? He doesn't speak directly about much of it. He doesn't. But now, does that mean that Jesus cannot have an opinion? No, I mean, there's a thing in our book of uh, confessions, it goes back to the Westminster Confessions, which is kind of the first Presbyterian confession, and it talks about how we derive our theology as best we can from the scriptures and by good and necessary consequences of them. So it's allowing us to say, look, take what we know of the scriptures, and then take what we know of logic, reason, and the, the world around us, and by good and necessary consequence, we derive our theology from that. And so uh, here's Jesus, who never speaks about same-sex marriage. He does speak once, as far as I can think of, about marriage itself, but he never addresses anything, as far as I know. Uh, that we were talking about in any direct way. So here's the words of Jesus in a direct way. Matthew chapter 7, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. 
Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will know them by their fruits. Quick note, anytime the Bible is saying, uh, anytime the Bible is saying, and we had this in our reading last week, this is going to be cut out and thrown into the fire. Most of us as Western individualists have been trained to go, well, which one am I? Am I the good fruit that God is pleased with, or am I the bad fruit that's going to burn in a furnace? And I think the, the, the only way to stay sane with these very strong binaries that Scripture gives us is to go, we all have good and bad fruit inside of us. It's not which one, which column do you belong to? But instead, Lord, would you, in your grace and mercy, cut out the bad fruit from my life so that the good fruit can have the right place to grow in its space? So it's not finding and labeling human beings throughout time, space, and in our own lives. Which one are they? Are they good or bad? We all have good and bad inside of us. And what the Spirit wants to do to right is to cut out that which is not bringing life so that that which does can come forward. So when our lives bear good fruit, this is an indication that we are on God's path for our life. And this is borne witness throughout all of the scriptures. If we go to Psalm 1, the person who, you know, uh, uh, lives by the law of the Lord will bear good fruit in every season, right? They'll be like a tree by a stream that bears fruit in all seasons. And so an indication that we are on God's plan for our life is, are we bearing good fruit or aren't we? Now, and this is one thing that Kamara talks a lot about in our book. And one of the rejoinders to that is, sure, Dr. Eckermeyer, sure, Joel, that sounds good, but what about suffering? Doesn't Jesus call us to say, take up your cross and follow me and deny yourself? Of course, Jesus does say that, doesn't he? Of course he does. But one of the indications that we, again, are on God's path is that not that we're going to somehow avoid suffering or that following God's will for our life will mean that we're going to live carefree and, and happy all the time. But when we go through those difficult periods, when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil because your presence is with me. The abiding presence of God in the midst of struggle and suffering, that sense that, yes, this is really difficult. Sometimes life can be so painful, but I know that God is with me. My God's presence is here sustaining me. That is the indication that we are on the path. And what we are being asked, and have been asked for many, many decades now, to consider in the church is whether or not we have borne good fruit through our teachings in the LGBT community. Has the church and our teachings helped bring about better fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, fruits of the Spirit. Has, has our teaching brought that about in the lives of LGBTQ people, or has it instead brought about the bad fruit? Right. And part of what we're being asked to consider is the bad fruit. Uh, Actemeyer tells a story about Christy in the first couple chapters. Christy was a seminary student that he was teaching, and a long time she's trying to follow the traditional path that she understood it for sexuality. She's attracted to women, but she thinks the Bible says this is wrong, and so I must say no to myself, take up my cross, and follow Jesus, deny myself, deny my own romantic desires, and instead either do one of two things, right? Change my orientation or remain celibate. These are our two options under the traditional understanding of the church teaching. I don't see a third option. If you, if you can see one, let me know. But it seems to me, under the traditional understanding of marriage only being between a man and a woman, that means that we have said, and are saying to LGBT people, you need to either change your desires, change your orientation, or remain celibate. By, by the way, I meant to get a photo of this. Anybody seen the billboard, uh, holy matrimony is between a man and a woman that's somewhere here in Columbus? Yeah. Yeah. Has anybody else noticed that the two rings are both male rings? No. Go look at it closer next time. 
the rings, as far as I can tell, are the exact same size, which is wonderfully hilarious that sometimes the truth outs in spite of ourselves. <laughs> but we are being asked, Christy's story, and I have many stories in my life, I'm guessing some of you had stories in your life as well, of people who said, look, I tried to do it the way you taught me. And it hasn't brought about the good fruit that Jesus is talking about. I have not been living Psalm 1, but instead it has brought about all kinds of hurt and pain and suffering in my life. Um, I'll tell you briefly about a, a friend of mine, David, not his real name, but it's not my story. Um, I got to know David right towards the period where, like, I know the right thing to do. I told you last week, my heart knew the right thing. I don't think I had finished um, Batterson's book yet, so my head wasn't quite fully clicked into, now I believe biblically this is the right thing to affirm same sex marriage. But I'm all but there, and I got to know David. And I asked him about his story. I got to know him just as a, a colleague in ministry. Um, and we just never talked about his sexuality, though I knew that he was gay. And uh, so finally I asked him to, to, would, if he felt safe with me to share him some of his story on how it is that he came out as a gay man. And, uh, and I was blessed to hear that story, though it broke my heart. Just he grew up uh, in a conservative part of the church uh, and tried to do everything right. Uh, tried to, uh, like Christy, deny myself and follow Jesus because there was nothing more important in David's life than Jesus. Jesus and, and following Christ was all that he wanted to do with his life and to be a minister. Uh, and for a long time, that's exactly what he did. He uh, babysat his pastor's kids, was kind of a, uh, was held up, you know, a, a young leader in the church uh, and ended up getting married to a woman, as a lot of folks uh, often do when you're not given an option about how to live and find love, intimacy, and romance, you end up doing what the church tells you to do, which is to fall in love with, um, with the woman. And of course, the woman that he fell, uh, got married to, he did love very much. Uh, they just weren't compatible uh, as far as their intimacy was concerned. And so over the course of a 20-year marriage, he shared with me that they were physically intimate three times. Two of those times, they conceived children. Over the course of that time, I'm going to counseling, I'm going to all the things the church is telling me to do, and it's just not working. And I've tried for two decades, I've done everything that the church has asked me to do, and it still hasn't worked. And so eventually decided that he needed to divorce his wife, because as much as I love you as my friend, we are not intimate companions the way that spouses uh, are, are supposed to be. So he gets divorced. Uh, at that point, as he shared the story, I asked, I said, David, um, and I was still working at the Evangelical Megachurch at this point, and I said um, to him, if I were your pastor and you were in my church, regardless of what I want to say, our church's doctrine says uh, at least a couple things. One, I believe you. I want you to know that. I, I, I don't think that you're lying to me or that you haven't tried hard enough or that, you know, if you just did this, you'd be able to finally change. I believe you when you say that you done everything you can and it hasn't worked. But under the church that I work for and our teaching, you would need to remain celibate for the rest of your life. So I'm not telling you that, I, that you're lying, but I am telling you that under this church that I work for, you'd have to remain celibate for the rest of your life. And he said, uh, Joel, I tried that. And that's exactly what I wanted when I got divorced. This was exactly what I intended. Not that I'm going to go out and find a boyfriend, but I can't live what ended up being the lie of his marriage, so instead, uh, I'm gonna try to be celibate, and I ended up in communion suicide. And, um, and I told him, David, I don't want you to kill yourself, and I don't believe God wants you to kill yourself. And he said, at that point, I wasn't sure how to do this biblically in my head anymore, but when the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone, I found that it was not good for me to be alone. And so in my case, I just concluded that must mean that God would want me to be with someone the same gender. That was his story. Um, 
there are many, many stories like that. Um, if any of you have watched Pray Away this past week on Netflix, if you have and you still got it, yeah. I encourage you to do so. It's a difficult watch, um, but it's a very, very important watch. Because um, I am so proud to be in a church now with folks who say, look, I had this kind of, some of this at least figured out in the 60s. Praise God for you and for this church and for folks who had that open-mindedness, you know, long before I was even born. Uh, but there are still huge, huge parts of the church, and we should last week, the majority, not the, the vast majority, of the church in the world remains like the Billy Bush. <laughs> Marriage is this and not that. So I want to show a clip from Pray Away, if that would be all right. Uh, Julie Rogers is one of the, the uh, primary voices in the film, and Julie, I also recommended her book that came out last year. Um, and Julie is also one who did everything the way that she was supposed to. She was part of one of these ministries, uh, what are often now called ex-gay ministries. But what it was, like I said last week, these were not uh, the, these were not the gay haters. These are people who understood marriage between a man and a woman. Whether I like it or not, that's just the way that it is. And so, how can we minister with compassion to people who have orientations different. And so it was kind of using maybe some of the 12-step methody type small group things to help people change their orientation or remain celibate. And Julie was one who grew up in that and when she was being featured as a speaker on a national level in these ex-gay ministries. And uh, this is a, an account from her book on what that ended up leading her. I'm going to read from the section about the group gathering and living hope. How old were you? I was 17 when I started it. And then this goes pretty much like up through the end of college, I would say. The first time I burned myself, I was sitting on a curb outside of the church after a living hope meeting. As my cigarette burned low, without giving it much thought, I shoved the burning end of it into my shoulder and listened as the skin on my left arm sizzled. Shortly after that night, I sat alone in my room, lost in a whirlwind of fear, agony, and self-loathing. That's when I remember the cigarette burn and the wave of detachment that washed through my body the moment the fire seared my skin. After scanning my room for metal objects that would heat under fire, I landed on a quarter. Clamping the quarter with tweezers, I plunged into the flame of a lighter, my heart rate rising as the coin heated up. I inhaled, flexed my left arm, and pressed the quarter deep in my flesh until the skin broke and the pain numbed. <clears throat> I repeated the process at least 20 times that afternoon, staring straight lines into my shoulder, each a few inches wide. For weeks, I engaged in a routine of applying Neosporin to the wounds every morning and evening. We were safe in those moments, me and my body. I could roll up my shirt sleeve, expose my wounds, and be met with tenderness and compassion. In the years that followed, when the anguish became unbearable, I would return to this routine, burning straight lines in my shoulders and tending to the wounds to self-soothe. I've heard discretion described as anger turned inward. Perhaps that's what I was doing in my dorm room all those years ago. I took the rage I felt about living in a body that couldn't be submitted to the kind of body it was supposed to be, a straight body, a feminine body, a good Christian body, and I lit it on fire. catch that, what Julie was saying is that instead of because her body did not fit into what the church said it needed to be, 
which was a straight body, a feminine body. Instead, she decided that she wanted to light her body on fire. Um, thankfully, she wins the United Nations and has uh, come out from this level of self-hatred uh, and is now married to uh, a man who we see in the video there. And incredibly, they were married at the National Cathedral. Um, and when they were married, Julie decided she wanted to have her uh, she wanted to have a sleeveless wedding dress. And you can see all the scars up and down her arms as she got married in the National Cathedral uh, as a way of saying even these belong to these can be part, these, this is part of my story. I can't pretend like it isn't, but it is. And now maybe in some way God is redeeming that part of my story as well. The fruit that the church has borne in the lives of LGBT people, um, I think, has been nothing short of toxic. And, and for those who want to argue differently, I just want to say, come with your seats. Because the receipts on the other side have mounted up so high that the mental gymnastics it now takes to go through, oh, wait a minute, uh, what, what we're doing is different now, right? Well, we're, we're a more compassionate version Show us the fruits. Show us the data that says that, that people who are undergoing your therapy, your whatever whatever treatment that you're giving, end up that those people end up living happier, healthier, more fulfilled lives. Or are they, as the data suggests, uh, people who go through some form of conversion therapy? And all this language can be uh, people. Oh, no, we're not doing conversion therapy. Oh, great, whatever, uh, whatever you want to call it. The, the form of treatment that you're giving to LGBT people to either change their orientation or convince them to remain celibate in one form or another. Show us the data that shows those people are less likely to kill themselves. Because you don't have it. And until you do, uh, you got to change things. And I'll even submit, there may be a way to hold the traditional position. This is me maybe going too far out of my way to bless those of you I disagree. But there may be a way to hold the traditional position on marriage and not lead people to self-harm. But y'all got to come up with what that is. Um, and I'll listen to you, right? Uh, you may not be able to go through this kind of biblical uh, reinterpretation, uh, expanding our understanding of who's welcomed into marriage. You, for whatever reason, may not be able to go down that path. Um, and fine, uh, you're not alone, right? A lot of people in the church feel that way. But you got, we all have some, if we're going to hold that position, the traditional position, uh, there has to be a way that people don't end up harming themselves as a result of that ministry. And right now, all the data suggests the opposite, because it's bearing toxic fruit. So another form of self-harming, I know someone attempted is cutting. Oh, yes. You know of anyone? Yeah. Does. Cutting is a common form of self-harm. and. Uh, as Julie described in, the, you know, in her book, it's a way to feel something. When, when, when you've been told time and time again that who you are is fundamentally broken and damaged, um, that messes with you. That messes with you in profound ways. Uh, so Actemeyer writes on page 13, what kind of God would put people through no fault of their own in a situation where the only spiritual options available to them were broken alienation from God or divine condemnation. So the first one, broken alienation from God, that's the option for those who say, I'm gonna live out my sexuality even though the Bible you know, says no to it, I'm going to say, forget it, Christianity, I'm gonna go live my truth. Then the option is, oh, well then you're broken and alienated from God, or you're under divine condemnation, which these are terrible options, right? And I don't know what alternative we have for the LGBT community. And again, I mean it when I say I would listen to it if folks said, Here, here's how it's different. Great, I'll listen to it. Uh, Access International fell 2013, 2014, somewhere in there, closed its doors. And that was the largest uh, international ministry to help people out of uh, the LGBT, uh, as they call it, lifestyle. It's not the language. <laughs> LGBT people like it. Um, and when they closed, I was still working at that mega church. And my supervisor, I had already been, I'd known David like 
I gotta get out of here, and I gotta go find the BCOSA is ultimately what I needed. But my supervisor, pastor of that church, said, well, I want you to come to this small uh, conference on ministry to LGBT people, and this guy has a different way. It was the um, some of the most abusive, horrible uh, rhetoric I've ever heard. This this man who's still teaching in our country um, claims to have changed his orientation, uh, happily married to a woman, which is fine. I have no I have no need to say it again. Your marriage is a sham. That's a you know you, that's between you and your wife, and I got no. Y'all go figure that out. I got nothing to say to you about that. It's not our business. But he taught, this is in Columbus, on a church, this is a vineyard church here, not the big one, but it was a vineyard church here in Columbus. And over this weekend teaching, uh, this so-called expert taught that with the gay men that he worked with, this is in New England, uh, he would sometimes hire female prostitutes to teach the, the gay men that you can have just as much pleasure having sex with a woman as with a man. Because in the end, it's all just blood. The man with the collar on, who's claiming to be hiring. But this is what. No, how did it work out? Yeah, how did it work out? That's the right. This, this is what uh, we're, we're scrambling, right, to fight. But but it doesn't. It's toxic. You're hi the whole thing is toxic. You're hiring sex workers to try to change someone's orientation. Everybody is being objectified and degraded in this and we're somehow blessing it with holy water. It shows no understanding of what it would mean to be gay. Yes. Zero. And it, and, but it also, like, and you understand why, which is if you're convinced that God hates this part of who you are, you'll go through anything, right? Who wants to go to hell? Who wants to be under God's condemnation? So I'll do anything to help myself or others who are in a similar situation. Instead of maybe thinking, maybe we need to rethink, maybe God doesn't hate this. That, that was the heartrending thing about the movie, was that um, all these people involved in Exodus just loved Jesus. Yes. They just, they, they just were so involved in their faith yeah. and so misguided by their leader. The leaders who were trying, yep. what they thought was different, but I thought that was helpful that you said that um, yeah. last week. They're not trying to harm you, they're actually trying to help you. Yeah, because I remember in the early 70s that that was the teaching of our church. Yeah. And I was always a little bit confused because being in music, I mean, yes. it's just like- Work in the arts. Of course you're getting the arts, yeah. right? It wasn't, it wasn't a thing. Um, and I remember my father, a pastor, said, so what do you think about this? And I said, well, they're my friends and they love each other and it's a beautiful relationship. So I don't understand what to believe. Yeah. And that was you know, when I was 16, 17 years old. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't understand what to believe with that. And so he said, well, this is how we do it, but it's really not for us to judge a person's so, sexuality. Which is a, a great place rather than a condemnatory place. And a lot of folks then would, would uh, not in any way putting words in your mouth or your dad's or anybody else's, but a lot of folks in that situation say, we end up in some form of uh, hate the sin, love the sinner. Yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. Right, and um, which uh, I don't think Sherry would uh, mind me saying this, that she said that that's one of the most hurtful things you could ever say to me. Because you're saying that, that this central part of who I am, you hate. And, and this relationship that I have, you hate. Um, and how deep and hurtful that is. And, and, and your example, I won't take you off so you can hear me. <clears throat> In your example about you know prostitutes and if you have a different experiences you'll change your mind um, during my PhD work um, at Ohio State my minor was human sexuality uh, and I was doing therapy um, uh, I studied on two occasions with small groups you know, go through <laughs> a lot of um, uh, processes to get it but I studied with Masters and Johnson in St. Louis and he was an OBGYN, he's since deceased, uh, an OBGYN, and came to uh, St. Louis Blue Trinity, actually. Um, he wanted to study with uh, uh, Dr. Um, Johnny Hobbs, who actually delivered me, because <laughs> my mother was a high risk. And um, 
and um, and he started doing studies in the 50s, and obviously his joke was, you don't think I can get a government grant or even a private foundation grant to do studies on homosexuality in the 50s. So private people gave him money, but yes. he, part of the clientele who came to him were high executives, a lot of men, who were CEOs, chief financial officers who were gay, some married, some not, yeah. who realized that if they were outed, they'd lose everything. Yep. I mean, they would have been fired, pensions pulled, everything. And worse, electroshock therapy. I mean, that's you know, what we were they doing. tried that. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, they did, so, you know, movies with, you know, yeah. physical stimulation. What they found over the, you know, about a, 10 years is that even these people who are extremely motivated, very, very highly motivated. No one lasted more than three years with extreme attempts. And he said, it's genetic. Yeah. He said, most homosexuals know by the third and fourth grade that something's different about them. And they'll go to the prom, they'll try very hard to fit in, but it's not, it's not. It's not working. Our former daughter-in-law is married to Jennifer, and she left our son after 18 years of marriage and two boys, and we love her dearly. She came from a very dysfunctional family and lived with us. We helped her get through college, so she is our daughter, always will be. And she and Jennifer are very happy, and we're finally, after four years, speaking of five years, um, our son finally agreed and, and valued them to carry a Brian's home for a blended holiday at Thanksgiving. Before that, I tried to put it together, and Brian said, you do that, Mom, and I won't come. And so, some for some, it takes It takes time. longer. It does get time. But it's not something people can ch change by choice. No, and, and as we saw in, you know, in this film and from other people that we know, it, it, if you could change, like, a lot of folks have done everything they possibly can, and it's not that. It's probably been a year ago that I read a very good book, and I'm trying to come up with the name of it so I can share it, but I haven't found it in the record yet. Uh, it was for a young man who was about the age of 15 who decided that he must be gay. But he didn't share it with his parents. He went off to college and he came back home and said to his folks, I'm gay. They were totally unaccepting of it, and they said, you're not gay. Oh, and these places still exist all over our country. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Well, he tried his best and just could yep. not adhere to their principles. Yep. So finally, he went back home and he said, I can't do it. Yep. I'm gay. And they never had one more thing to do with it. It was yep. the saddest ending because they did not accept it. What time period was it? That is, the book is just a few years old. Oh, so it's a career. One of the leading causes of, of child, you know, minors who are homeless in our country is exactly that story. That they've come out to their parents, been rejected, and, and leave. And if you are a minor and you are homeless, uh, what kind of dangers does that uh, expose you to? Uh, obviously, substance abuse, all kinds of physical harm to your body, sexual trafficking, all this stuff because parents are trying, it's, that's what's so tragic about the situation, is they are trying to love their child by enforcing their faith. And what we need to start finding ways is to help parents and help churches and help communities love their children by accepting them. Yeah. Um, this verse has meant a lot to me uh, over the years on, on as my thoughts have changed these years. Other words of Jesus. Whoops. Sorry. Not that one. That's a good one, too. We'll start with uh, Jesus here. It's on your uh, page, Matthew 23. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. 
this verse to me is going to, this, this, if, if I had Jesus' words to say to the church on how we've treated the LGBT community, this is, we've tied up unbearable burdens on people and not lifted a finger to help. Um, so a better way, of course, is this way of love. <laughs> and love is a difficult word, right? Because every Christian is trying to love their neighbor as themselves. Um, but part of, of a coherent theology of love is to trust, we have to be willing to trust the first thing that we are seeking to love knows something about themselves and their well-being that we don't know. And that's what those parents who are rejecting their kids are unwilling to see. No, no, I know what's better for you. We're trying to protect you from God's condemnation, from whatever it is they think being gay is going to expose the child to. But we've got to learn that love means trusting the other person enough that they know something about themselves that we don't know. And one of the best ways to kind of figure that out on a very practical level is the issue of harm. Right? So on the traditional side, see, look, there's all kinds of sins that are bad for you that a person may be engaged in, and, and indulging it doesn't help. Like addiction. If we just allow folks to say, hey, live in your addiction, I got no problem, you know, you, you do your life your way, I'll do it my way, and trust. But what's the problem? Well, of course, with addiction, all kinds of what? Harm comes into your life, into the life of the people around you. You're not bearing the good fruit when you are addicted to heroin, right? You're, you're, you're bearing the, the toxic fruit. But when it comes to the LGBT community, we have so much evidence now that shows the toxic fruit comes from trying to do it the traditional way, and the good fruit comes from when I can finally just accept this is something about who I am, and whether I can square this way with my faith or not, I'm going to live my truth, and all of a sudden the desire to cut, the suicidal ideation, Right, the self-hatred begins to go down, and as it does, the good fruit comes up. So the traditional understanding would say, to me, where I am, Joel, there's all kinds of sins that uh, we don't just say yes to, and they'll point to, like I said, alcoholism or, or any number of addictions. And how is LGBT any different? And the big answer, again, is this issue of fruit. It's harm. It's harm. And we've got to come to grips with the harm that we have caused and then find a better way. i got to close because i got to get to church. Uh, Romans 13, we'll get to the rest of it. Uh, no. uh, Romans 13, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. These are the words of Paul from a book that is often used as a, uh, Romans 1 is used as a sledgehammer over the LGBT community. We're going to get to Romans 1, I promise you. But here we are at the end of the book, in Romans 13. And what we often see in Paul's writings is wait till he gets to the end. He's really, you know, oftentimes he's setting up arguments early on to bring you to a point of conclusion. And here's his conclusion. Do you want to fulfill the law? Love the other person as you love yourself. It really is that simple. In the end. Okay, folks, next week we're going to try to do chapters 3 through 5. Might be a lot, might be too much. We're going to do our best when we get uh, into proper principles for biblical interpretation taking our time, and then we'll get into what is God's intention for marriage to begin with. If, if we can discern from the scriptures what God's intentions are for marriage, then we can ask, can LGBT people fit into those intentions? That's where Adam Meyer's taking us, that's where we'll go. For now, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for these people, thank you for this church, thank you for all of those Christians across the world who are striving for a better way, seeing that what we've done hasn't been good enough. So Lord, as we seek as a church how we might better embody this love for neighbor that you have called us to live into. Give us wisdom. Give us compassion for each other, for those of whom we disagree. Give us compassion for the LGBT community who's been so harmed by the church's teaching. Lord, we want to come out of this not with self-righteous 
feelings about how enlightened we are, but instead with compassion for all, for that is how you treat us. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Check out the new art exhibit if you haven't. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Like, what do I do with this? There, and that's a great, you know, we all have a lot of. Uh, I'd love to hear that too.